Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about Terry Pratchett, atheism, and existentialism. So, I really struggled with this script for uh, this video because there's a lot of ground to cover. It's both very academic and very personal, so get ready! Here's the plan. First, we'll talk briefly about who Pratchett was, then we'll go into existentialism, and then we'll see how Pratchett used his books to explore existentialism in a surprisingly positive way. And then I'm probably going to ramble about how these books helped me personally for a while. So this is a big thank you to my patrons who voted for this, and then were very patient while I took my sweet ass time making it. So let's go. One. Who is Terry Pratchett? Sir Terry Pratchett is my favorite author of all time, and was a British sci-fi and fantasy author who is best known for his massive collection of books set in Discworld. His Discworld books are funny, often satirical fantasy works set on the disc, a flat world held up on the back of elephants riding on a turtle swimming through space. That doesn't come up much, but it's worth mentioning here. There's witches, and wizards, and trolls, and dwarves, and dragons. There's also policemen, and bankers, and postmen, and all other manner of strange creatures on the disc. And the books, while being very funny, are prone to discussing politics, and economics, and human nature in a way that is profoundly insightful. The reading order of the books is very fluid, since there are multiple mini-series within Discworld. You can hop around and read all of the guard books, or all of the witch books, or all of the death books, etc. There are 41 books set in Discworld, and so even though Sir Terry passed away in 2015, there's enough of his books to read and reread for a long time. It's also worth noting that he was a pretty well-known atheist. When asked about whether he believed in God or gods, Pratchett answered thus in an interview. Humans are shaped by the universe to be its consciousness. We tell the universe what it is. In my religion, the building of a telescope is the building of a cathedral. I have no truck whatsoever with Genesis. I was inoculated against the Christian religion by reading the whole of the Old Testament in one go, apart from the begats. And I thought, if this were true, we were in the hands of a maniac. Now, in 2008, right after he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, some stories went around about Pratchett finding God, which if you actually look at what he said, is quite a reach. He talked about how he felt there might be some structure in the universe, something that could fill a hole, but also clarified that I'm certainly not a man of faith, and that the possibility of there being structure in the universe only makes sense, quote, once you have got past all the gods that we have created with big beards and many human traits, end quote. So to say that he found God is an exaggeration. But it's worth saying here that his views on religion and faith and God were both nuanced and shifted here and there as he dealt with his disease. Despite this, though, Terry Pratchett's Discworld is not an atheistic universe. There are gods in Discworld, which we'll talk more about later. Discworld is, also, notably, a very existential world. Which brings me to, what is existentialism? Full disclosure, this will be baby's first existentialism, and will not cover every and all nuances possible, but I'll do my best to present a simple, accurate, and usable definition. So, very simply, existentialism is a philosophical outlook that rejects the idea of a divine or inherent value in the universe. If you look at philosophy and religion prior to, like, the 19th century, the vast majority begin with the assumption that there is some innate, immutable value system in the universe, that a god or gods created the universe with a plan in mind, that there are morally correct and incorrect ways of behaving that are universally true, that people have an inherent purpose or value or karma that they should strive to meet. There is this idea that all people have some sort of essence, labels, roles, definitions, or other preconceived categories categories that should define how they conduct themselves, whether this is a caste system or a list of commandments. That destiny, fate, etc. are real things that make up who we are. 
existentialism looks at all that and says, no, this is garbage. There is no plan. There is no inherent value. Things just exist because they exist. The universe is absurd, not funny, but meaningless. The illusion of meaning is created by people to guide them and to avoid the dread and terror that true freedom within the absurd can create. So simply, nothing actually means anything. All meaning is created by humans and people should try to embrace the freedom and authenticity or else risk being blinded by inauthentic forms of meaning or fall into existential despair. This last bit is somewhat debated by existentialist philosophers, as are most things in philosophy, but in general, existentialism isn't like super against creating authentic meaning for yourself. Now, existentialism is closely related to nihilism, and they are easy to confuse for one another. While existentialism argues nothing really means anything, so people create their own meaning, nihilism argues nothing really means anything, and pretending otherwise is pointless and horrible. So, there's overlap. Now, normally, when we look at existentialism in literature, things tend to be kind of depressing, and it's because it often treads rather close to nihilism. If you've ever studied existentialism within an academic context, especially within the English department of a large public university in Central Texas in the early 2010s, you've probably read Camus, like me. I had to read Camus in college. Camus was a French author and philosopher, and his books tend to be the go-to example for existential fiction. The Stranger and the Myth of Sisyphus are popular, but I read The Plague in college, so that's what we're going to touch on. The Plague tells the story of a city in French Algeria that is quarantined as a plague sweeps the city, trapping everyone inside until the sickness subsides. The cast of characters must confront the senseless death and grapple with how to make sense of it within their own worldviews. You've got the priest, the doctor, the clerk, etc., who are ultimately faced with the terror of the absurd, that there is no meaning for this suffering, no purpose in this death and how these characters construct their own meaning to cope with this absurd terror explores Camus' own fascination with existentialism and the absurd. It is not a lighthearted book. At all. And that's why I want to spiral back to Terry Pratchett and his Discworld books, which are very existentialist, but are not depressing. So let's look at how Terry Pratchett explores existentialism. We're going to look at two books here in particular, though there are many Discworld books that have echoes of this. As I said before, Discworld is not an atheistic world. If anything, it is pantheistic. All the gods are real, and that gives Terry a lot of space to talk about religion and philosophy in some interesting ways. I will try to avoid any major spoilers for these two books, but I will touch on a few details in my analysis. So, you should be safe overall, but here's a warning. The first is Small Gods. Small Gods is the 13th Discworld novel and is one of the very few that is truly standalone. It's set much earlier than most of the other books and in a part of the world we don't see often in the other books. So, we're in the Empire of Omnia. Think 90% Catholic Church during the Inquisition, with some smatterings of Islam thrown in there for aesthetics. The Church of Ohm is in the middle of an Inquisition and on the verge of war with its neighbors, when Brutha, an illiterate novice who works in the gardens, is visited by a one-eyed talking tortoise who claims to be the great god Ohm, trapped in this body and unable to return to his normal state. This begins an adventure where Brutha gets dragged into some of the politics of the church, travels to another country, learns about philosophy, gets lost in the desert, all with his god in tow. It's a great book that really explores not only the dangers, but also the purpose of religion and how people interact with their faith. But let's talk about how it explores existentialism. The first thing is that the book explores the nature of gods themselves. You see, in Discworld, a god's power, influence, and even appearance is dictated by the belief humans put in them. The more believers a god has, the more power they have. Ohm has been trapped as a tortoise because he discovers that in all of Omnia, only Brutha truly believes in him. 
Everyone else goes through the motions, sings the songs, follows the commandments, uses the structure of religion to give them meaning, but have no true faith. People don't believe in gods because they are real in Discworld. The gods are real because people believe in them, which fits nicely into the existentialist idea of people creating their own meaning in an ultimately meaningless world. The gods are given form by their believers. The book also ch directly challenges the idea of an inherent God-given meaning, as it looks at the previous prophets. Brutha discovers that the previous prophets of Om, who went into the desert and returned with commandments, didn't speak to Om. Om tells him that he doesn't even remember them. These prophets created their own meaning, their commandments for how to live, and set them down as religious laws, created by people, not ordained by God. Which, you know, is a pretty harsh realization for the last true believer to deal with. I don't want to get too spoilery here with the book, because I think you should read it if you haven't yet, uh, but ultimately, the book isn't a condemnation of religion as a whole. It does explore how religion can be used to harm people, but argues for reform, not destruction. It portrays religion as a useful framework for creating meaning, even if we recognize that this meaning is not an inherent divine truth. Also, it has a whole plot point about the disc having round earthers who are science deniers because the disc really is flat. It's, it's funny. It's a good book. So that's Pratchett using existentialism to look at religion specifically and explore how religion gives people a framework of meaning for better or worse. The second book we're going to talk about takes a broader view. The Hogfather. Hogfather is the 20th Discworld book, and the fourth in the Death books. It's the best, weirdest, almost Christmas book you'll ever read. And I do recommend putting the film adaptation on your list of kind of weird movies to watch at Christmas. The basic plot is that, for reasons, an assassin has been hired to end the Hogfather, who is, you know, Discworld Santa. Death, like, yeah, death, decides to dress up and fill in for the Hogfather to keep belief in him alive, while his adopted granddaughter Susan finds a way to stop the assassin and save the day. It begins on a fairly existential note, with the narrator musing on the nature of beginnings, why things happen the way they happen, and then it says, The philosopher Didactylus has suggested an alternative hypothesis. Things just happen, what the hell? Which, you want to talk about an easy definition of existentialism. Things just happen, what the hell? The book has some very similar ideas as Small Gods in that it talks about how magical beings like the Hogfather, Tooth Fairies, Monsters Under the Bed, and the Soul Cake Duck exist because of people's belief in them. Again, this idea that people's belief is an act of creation rather than a passive response to things already existing. There's a whole ongoing joke that because belief in the Hogfather is waning, there's extra belief magic around, so people's silly belief in things like sock eaters is causing those critters to pop into existence. But here's the bit where the book gets really existential. It's towards the end, and no spoilers, Susan is talking to Death about why it's so important to save the Hogfather. All right, said Susan, I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really, as if it were some kind of pink pill. No, humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies, hog fathers, little, yes, as practice. You have to start out learning to believe the little lies so we can believe the big ones. Yes, justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. And yet, you try to act as if there is some ideal order in the world. You need to believe in things that aren't true. How else can they become? So this passage gets right to the heart of existentialism. 
It argues that our most basic values, justice, mercy, duty, that these things are not fundamental truths in the universe, that there is no ideal order, but instead that these things are illusions constructed by people's belief in them, that they are essentially lies to give people direction in an absurd universe. And yet this is not a depressing book. It's one of the most hopeful and uplifting books I know, because Death's argument is that by believing in these values, these values become real. Just like the Hogfather, just like the Tooth Fairies, just like the Sock Eater, our act of creating meaning makes the meaning real. And here's where I talk about my personal feelings and my journey with atheism for a while. Because that last line, you need to believe in things that aren't true, how else can they become? I come back to that line all the time. I was raised vaguely Methodist Christian in a not that small town in Texas. Every now and then my parents would decide that maybe Sunday school was a good idea, but as I and my siblings got older, church was more and more an Easter or Christmas Eve thing. I knew the stories, knew the little rituals, yada yada, but my faith never developed any more depth than my belief in Santa. It was a story that people said was true, so okay. So when I got to middle school and realized that, like, you don't have to believe in Jesus, it took literally 10 seconds for me to realize that I didn't. But you have to understand that I had spent my whole life up to that point being told that religion is what teaches people how to live, where morals come from, that these rituals and these stories and this truth is what gives us purpose and direction. I believed that belief itself was important. And just because I didn't believe in Jesus didn't make all that go away. So I spent years trying to find a religion that did feel true, and I would read their stories, and I would try to find the ones that felt right. And none of them did. None of them felt any more true than all the fiction I read, Harry Potter or Percy Jackson or Lord of the Rings. And it was during this period in my life when I so deeply wanted a framework to justify my morals and my meaning that I found Terry Pratchett. And here were these books telling me it's okay. You don't actually need all that. You don't need this framework of religion for you to believe in justice, in mercy, in duty. Your belief in those things is enough. If you believe that they are true, they can become. These books gave me the sense of security to start looking into atheist thought and atheist communities, into challenging my beliefs and learning about things on my own terms. And all of that shaped how I view the world. It's given me a sense of confidence in believing what I believe for my own reasons. I don't need religion to justify believing in compassion and community and justice. Existentialism has empowered me to create my own authentic meaning outside of artificial frameworks. It helped me become myself. So I guess what I'm saying is, read these books. <laughs> Whether you're religious or not, I think they're very powerful and very thoughtful. And they are personally meaningful to me. And they're funny as hell. And just great. They're great books. Oh, also, uh, Good Omens, the book that introduced me to Sir Terry and Neil Gaiman in One Fell Swoop, is getting a TV adaptation this year. So I'll probably make like a million videos on that when it comes out. Fair warning. Uh, so thank you again for watching, uh, and an extra thank you to all my patrons who support all these videos. Be sure to go check out the next poll for video topics. If you like listening to this queer millennial feminist ramble about stuff for a while, do all the YouTube stuff, and I'll see you next time. Gnu, Terry Pratchett. We miss you. And thank you for all that you shared with us.